What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today we are talking about depression and oppression, looking especially at the experiences of women of color in the mental health system with diagnosis and the way in which illnesses are seen to be within the individual rather than looking at the larger um, social and political context that people um, are living in. And today we have Alicia Ali. She is an associate professor at the Department of Applied Psychology at New York University. Alicia's research focuses on mental health issues among the poor, including the effects of discrimination and the need for collective advocacy for the mental health needs of disadvantaged populations. Her upcoming book entitled Cultural Perspectives on Women's Depression, co-edited with Dr. Dana Jack, is being published by Oxford University Press. So welcome to Madness Radio, Dr. Alicia Ali. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in this topic. Um, it doesn't get talked about um, enough, mental health in the context of social oppression in general, race and class issues. Now, you have done a, a very interesting study that was actually funded by the National Institute of Mental Health about depression in ethnic minority uh, communities. Can you tell us about that study and uh, the implications of it? Yes, yeah, so, you know, we do know that there is an association between what we call depression and living below the poverty line. So there are a whole host of um, mental health problems that occur more frequently in people who are poor than in people who are um, well off. And when we think about depression as an example of a very common mental health problem that occurs in a general population with a relatively high frequency, we have to think about issues of being poor and living in poverty because the things that make people feel those things that are associated with depression, which are extreme sadness, low sense of self-worth, and just a low motivation in doing things in one's life, we can see that it's logical that those would be connected to poverty. However, as you say, issues of poverty and the real life experiences of people who live in poverty are not represented within the literature and psychiatry. And so what I decide to do is rather than look in most of the settings that are examined in the mainstream depression research, which is either state-of-the-art clinics or within undergraduate samples of students at um, the top research universities, I looked at women and men as well who are attending a poverty transition program. Program. My choice for this was that we really have populations that are usually studied when we look at depression that are very privileged populations. So, for example, when we look at people who are in treatment within university teaching hospitals for depression in these clinical trials, they are people who usually have insurance have had the wherewithal to either seek out this treatment study where they could get um, a new treatment for depression or whatever condition they, they feel they have, or they've been referred by a physician who is aware of some study going on on depression, and that physician refers them to a state-of-the-art medical center. Those people are usually not people who are low income. And so there's, there's an example of where people who live below the poverty line are not often represented in studies of those types. So you're saying that the baseline of the science and the research and the clinical trials doesn't even include the experiences of um, the poor, that it's based on a very privileged and primarily white population, because the idea is that it's, it doesn't matter. So we might it's a brain problem, so it doesn't matter mm-hmm. whether someone's... Um, uh, background is poor or not. Let's just um, study the brain and stru- study the, the neutral emotions. Exactly. And it's very important that we realize that because when we think about the assumption that these problems are based not only just in the individual but within the individual's brain, then one would presume that the brains do not differ across different socioeconomic levels. That's, what, that's one of the assumptions. Um, the other assumption is that any trials, let's say a trial of an antidepressant medication, um, would 
look similar within people who are low income and people who are not because if it's targeting the brain and brains do not differ, therefore the effects should be um, studyable in any of these um, various subpopulations. So based on this um, insight that you had, you decided to look at women who were in a poverty transition program. Is that uh, some kind of um, agency or something that's supporting women who are poor? Yes, it's, it, it supports um, men and women. And um, it basically, it, it's, it's um, based in New York City, and it is for low-income women and men who want to um, become economically self-sufficient. They currently live below the poverty line, and they come to this setting where they are put through a training program that allows them to learn how to become um, basically budding entrepreneurs. They come with an idea for um, an entrepreneurial venture. So let's say something like starting their own dressmaking business. And what happens is that they come with an idea, they are given um, training and microcredit loans. So it's based on the micro lending model that has been used in so-called developing countries to great success, but has not been used much at all within the U.S. And so this is using this um, international development model and trying it out here in the U.S. And what they found is that with these uh, men and women who live below the poverty line who are not eligible to get any sort of loan from the bank for a business or anything else, that they have a loan payback rate that is usually well over 90% every year because they work in a collective form. What happens is people go through this business within a small peer group, and when they, when they begin their individual businesses within their group, they have a shared accountability for their loan payback. So let's say you and I were in the same group. If I couldn't pay my loan back, the rest of you, the other members in the group, have to pay it back. And so it works in a very collective, um, socially based way. Now it sounds like your study was to look at depression um, among the people who were in this program, right? Yes, it, it, I was interested in depression um, because it is you know, relatively common among people who live below, below the poverty line and um, also because it's something that is understandable to someone who does not have a lot of resources. It's understandable to us to see that they would be susceptible to depression. So what I did is I looked at the levels of depression among men and women as they came into this program before they had begun any active involvement in the program, and then months later after they had gone through the program and had actually become um, more successful in changing the material conditions of their lives and becoming economically self-sufficient. And I found that for the women and the men, there was a significant decrease in their levels of depression as they went through this program. They were not receiving any other kind of psychiatric treatment or mental no. health care that might affect the outcome. It's, it was specifically a result of becoming economically empowered around their poverty issues. Yes, that's correct. And in fact, if they were receiving psychological or psychiatric counseling, um, or if they were receiving any sort of psychotropic medication, antidepressants, or the like, they were not taking part in the study. I can tell you there are very few such people who, who were in the study anyways. Um, and so it's important for us to realize that there was no psychological or psychiatric intervention delivered to any of the participants who went through the study. It was really around changing um, their feelings of empowerment and their self-sufficiency self -sufficiency around their own economic and financial survival. So how were you defining um, depression? Were you using a pretty standard uh, assessment tool so that you could actually um, compare to the effectiveness of other kinds of, of treatments that you kind of got the poverty cure, the, the anti-poverty cure as a mental health treatment and to see how that effective that was? Yes, exactly. I mean, there were, there were two reasons. One, as you mentioned, is the comparability issue. And the other is that this, this study was funded by NIMH, and um, it was necessary for me to speak to the existing literature so that the funders could understand that I'm aware of the usual approaches that are taken to treat depression and how depression is defined in those studies, which is based on the DSM criteria of unipolar major depression. So this is an NIMH study. So this is pretty much the gold standard as far as mainstream mental health research goes. And it, the results are pretty pretty remarkable that the anti-poverty program had a, had a significant effect on people's depression. Have there been other kinds of studies like this, or is this pretty much a whole new area of um, research? Yeah, you know, my research team and I um, 
really went very extensively through the psychological, psychiatric, and even the sociological research to see if there would be anything of this nature. And in fact, there is not because, um, as you mentioned, we, we went to do this comparability, and so we did use a DSM um, diagnosis as a way of tracking people through the program. And most people who would do um, community-oriented intervention research of this nature would not be using DSM categorization to follow their participants because, I mean, these, these really sound like two different worlds. You know, when you right, think about the right. world of psychiatry and the world of community development, those are two things that are rarely brought together. And so that's why. It seems from a kind of a mental health uh, discussion framework, very counterintuitive that we're going to address people's poverty as a way of um, helping their depression. But actually from a common sense standpoint, if you actually think about people's lives in context and what makes people depressed, it makes a lot of sense that the study would show so um, positive results of the anti-poverty um, program. Now let's get into the implications of the study because, I mean, you raised um, the issues of the way in which depression is seen as, as located within the brain, which goes against any kind of social context. Is that basically why you think studies like this haven't been funded or even thought about much? I mean, I think part of the reason is that um, so much of the research is geared towards understanding um, new ways and new reasons to use medication as a treatment of choice for people who have depression or indeed any other mental health problem. And so that approach, therefore, necessitates a focus on the brain, on the individual, and indeed a focus on individual pathology. And so the idea that the ill is located within the person um, really runs counter to the idea that maybe the problem begins in, in a much larger way within society as a whole. Yeah, the and example that I use is, is kind of like uh, psychiatry has a toolbox, but the toolbox is completely full of hammers because the hammers are provided by the funding of the owners of the toolbox. And so as a right. result, you just go looking around for nails to hit, and the that's medication right. is the nail. Like, which nail do we need to hit people with? I mean, when we think about the need to help people who, who have something like depression, or if you don't want to use the term depression, just have, um, you know, feelings of anguish and, and persistent unhappiness in, in their lives, there are so many options that not only might be as effective or more effective than medication, but that the person might actually feel good about the process of help, the process of changing their lives from an economic point of view versus the process of regularly taking a pill are very different. I mean, one, one is empowering in a very broad sense, and one, to many people, is, is disempowering the fact that they have to take something like a pill to fix something that's wrong in their body. It, it's really a regular reminder that there's something defective in them. And so when we think about an intervention of this nature, which again is not a psychological intervention but a more socially oriented inter intervention, we could actually see that over the long term it could have um, an additive effect in that you know, when people begin to become more self-sufficient, it actually builds the resources around them and, and their families in a way that is, is structurally scaffolding themselves, their children, and future generations, as opposed to a model where medication is the treatment of choice and there is a reliance on that medication and you know, possibly an over-reliance on that medication and what that means for someone in the long term, not only in terms of side effects, but in terms of how they then think of themselves as a defective individual. I know that was definitely the case with me. I was diagnosed with schizoaffective schizophrenia after having been through a lot of different kinds of treatments and getting other kinds of labels like depression um, as well. And just the way in which it disempowers you and takes away your sense of control that you can actually make a difference in your life, it's, it's just devastating. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy that you label someone as having a problem inside of them and then it, it ends up creating that for the person and then they get stuck in that position and uh, that role and it took me years and I'm still struggling with this to get out of that that um, framework of seeing myself um, in that way and I think especially when you're looking at a society where there's oppression and there's inequality it's very useful for the status quo and for maintaining business as usual to have people think in terms of their problems 
being inside of them rather than, as your study demonstrates, connected to the circumstances, including poverty and class issues that they find themselves in. You mentioned that for the purposes of the study, you're using a definition of depression that comes from other studies because you wanted to be able to compare the, the outcomes. But let's talk a little bit about the, the values and the cultural assumptions that go into our understandings of what depression is. I mean, I think in, in a lot of ways, you know, depression is unlike many other um, mental health conditions in that it's something that people use in our day-to-day language to describe how we're feeling. And so um, it does really allow, let's take, for example, the direct-to-consumer advertising around depression that we see in magazines and televisions. It allows that advertising to feel relevant to large numbers of people, um, and it really normalizes the idea of being mentally ill. It's such an interesting um, paradox in that you have to think of yourself as being somehow defective in order to be medicated, and yet what a lot of the drug company advertisements do is try to make us feel as though it's somehow so common to be depressed or to be anxious that we're already targets for medication. And so, you know, depression is, is interesting in that respect. It's also interesting in that it does carry a stigma, but as you say, it's a stigma that means that you are somehow ineffective in moving forward in your own life. I, I, I remember interviewing a woman who um, had suffered with extreme sadness and lack of motivation for years, and when she saw a psychiatrist and was given the diagnosis of depression, by the time she was in my research study and I was interviewing her about the different aspects of her life where she could readily make change, her explanation was, well, I'm a depressive. I'm not a person who can do that. And so she had internalized this label and was, you know, to herself and others, calling herself a depressive. And what that means is that to her, she's not someone who is capable of creating positive change in her life. And so it's very closely connected to the idea of oppression and the idea of social inequalities. Because, I mean, we think about our society here in this country, the political and social systems are really predicated on the silencing of marginalized individuals who do not have the economic or social wherewithal to create positive change because of the way the system is structured. And in many ways, the mental health establishment itself is part of that system, that system of control and that system of keeping people where they are. What about the dynamic that I see a lot, which is that people are absolutely suffering and experiencing just terrible emotional distress, and they're also on top of that, they're blaming themselves. They're saying, this is my fault, this is my fault, this is my fault. And then uh, someone comes along, a doctor offers them or therapist a label that's going to say, actually, it's not your fault it's a chemical imbalance in your brain. It's an illness. It's a disorder. And it's incredibly relieving for the person to have that experience of no longer feeling guilty that it's their fault, that that it's something that they should be able to overcome as an individual. That's sort of like a trap that I think that the pharmaceutical companies and, and the medication promotion seizes on. I mean, I think part of the issue is that... Um, Self-blame itself is so much a, a part of a condition like depression that um, you know people come to a therapist, a psychiatrist, already blaming themselves. And so to some people, they hear this explanation that the problem is not with you but within your brain. It's biological. And they feel liberated from their self-blame. Um, in most of my interviews with depressed women, um, the experience seems to be that they see that as yet another defect within them, that they're not only socially incompetent, not able to maintain relationships or a job, but now their brain is also defective. Um, I think part of it has to do with the way that um, the medical profession explains um, psychiatric medications to, to, to their patients. Um, you know, the idea is that they say, you know, a lot of my patients get very good results with so-and-so medication because they start feeling better about themselves. And to the patient, that, that explanation is supposed to mean this works 
in a physiological way in your brain, therefore the problem with your depression must be a physiological problem with your brain. And in a way, I mean, you know, when we think about, you know, let's say more common medications that, that we take, like, um, you know, pain relievers for a headache. If you're walking down the street and someone, you know, drops a brick from a, a window and it falls on your head and your head hurts and you take pain medication and it takes that pain away, it's a medication that works physiologically on pain receptors and the like so that you don't feel the pain as much anymore. But that doesn't mean that there was an endogenous or internal cause to your, your pain. The pain was an external, externally caused pain. And so if we think about the fact that the way that psychiatrists explain the workings of these drugs to their patients is very much based on this belief that I can liberate them from their self-blame and I can also ensure that they use my treatment of choice, then we see that in a way there's a, there's a collusion that goes on between you know, the drug companies themselves and the, the psychiatrists who prescribe these medications, and in some instances involving the patient as well who very deeply wants to be liberated from their own self-blame. What do you make of the um, push that psychiatry um, has right now where it says there are all these people of color who are not getting access to treatment, um, who, you know, there's a underutilization of services, and it's even couched in a sense of, um, like, this is related to civil rights issues, that uh, people of color need to have access to mental health care um, as much as um, the mainstream society. Um, and yet, in the context of what we're discussing, there's a whole other side uh, to this. Yes, I feel that there definitely is another side. Part of what happens is that we're always thinking within the box of mainstream treatment. And so when we realize that that, that treatment is, is really part of a model that is based on profits and, and the need for the psychiatric and drug industries to continue to succeed financially, we realize that those movements are in many ways geared towards including more and more people as possible targets as consumers of, of psychiatric and drug treatments. And so in that way, it makes economic sense for the drug companies to want to include that many people, as many people as possible, um, as those, those targets. At the same time, we, we have to realize that from a therapeutic point of view, it's not as though there aren't psychotherapists who are very well-intentioned and want to become, you know, whatever term you want to use, um, you know, culturally competent or culturally aware, um, who want to be able to work broadly in a psychotherapeutic way with people of various cultures. But part of the issue is that when we think at, at a larger level and we think about the need for change, not of the individual, but of the larger system, then we realize that it may not be always the best way of serving, let's say, a woman of color who is experiencing low sense of self and feelings of disempowerment by bringing her into a medical setting, giving her a diagnostic label, and outlining for her a very narrow set of treatment options. Um, it's, 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 it's really an approach that is, is geared towards sustaining the current system and not looking at alternate systems that, in fact, may already be in place and, and could be helping enhance people's sense of self. What about the efforts that um, pharmaceutical companies and um, federal policy and the mainstream mental health system are very strong on right now, which is, which is called reducing stigma? And the idea is that if you have a diagnosis, uh, if you're suffering, that you shouldn't be ashamed of it, that you should actually have no reason to have any kind of, of stigma around that at all. And that sounds... It sounds really good, but again, there's another there's another side to this because the experience itself of being on medications and being diagnosed with a label is itself a stigmatizing experience that isn't talked about. It's as if we're supposed to normalize being on medication and having a, a disease label. Yes, that's correct. I mean, I mean, what destigmatization tries to do is two things. One is to motivate the person to go seek medical help from a GP or a psychiatrist or the like for whatever problem they're experiencing. And so it gets their foot into the door of the psychiatric system. So it's like stigma is an obstacle to the market, really. That's it's... right, exactly. And the other thing it does is that destigmatization has one of its aims 
um, encouraging the individual to talk to other people they know about what they're going through and making it sound um, you know, normal and fine in a way that, uh, again, being, if being depressed is thought of as, as normal and something that is very common, then there's really no shame in being medicated for it. So again, it's that, it's that paradox of being defective and um, normalized at the same time. And so if, if people talk more broadly about their problems, then every person they talk to then becomes a potential consumer because they see someone who's like them, a friend or family member, who is being medicated and being helped, and maybe they could be helped too. And so it, it again, provides that, that foot in the door. Especially and when the story is, um, you know, I was suffering, and then finally I overcame the stigma and I went to get treatment, and now I've been saved by my medication. People sort of become these sort of walking advertisements for, um, for mainstream treatment. That's right. And so, and, and, you know, we know that the stigma of being on psychiatric medication is not what it once was. It's not as stigmatized as it used to be. And again, the direct-to-consumer advertising on the part of drug companies is part of that reason. They can choose how they represent the person who is taking their drug, what they look like, how attractive they may be, how they dress, how they present themselves, and they present them as people who the viewer wants to be. And so that goes a very long way in destigmatizing the medication itself. I think in the early days of the advertising, you saw images of people suffering, but now with the advertising, you see images of people flourishing and happy and playing frisbee with their dog, and that's supposed to represent it's a typical advertising strategy to associate a positive experience with the product that you're selling. Exactly. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. We're speaking with Alicia Ali. She is a psychologist and researcher at NYU who focuses on depression, mental health, and women of color in her work critiquing mental health care. Now, we've been talking about um, your study around depression. I know also that you've been doing work around immigrant um, experience and immigrant women. Tell us about um, what the insights that you've gained from that research. It's been really interesting to me um, interviewing women, um, you know, almost entirely women of color who are immigrants and have found themselves in the psychiatric system as as inpatients or outpatients because um, it really seems as though they experience a lot of the challenges that patients experience within the system, but in a more extreme way. Because when you think about it, um, the system is very much based on the idea that there is an expert, a clinician who has the answers, and a person who has something wrong with them coming to be fixed. But if you are already marginalized because you're not white, and maybe English isn't your first language, and you're not familiar with the system, then there's more of a potential for there to be a greater power differential between you and the person who's providing services to you, psychiatrist or or whomever. And so what I found in my research is that um, there is certainly what we could call a cultural gap very often between the the psychiatrist and, and the woman who's coming for help, but also that there is an effect of you know, what we were talking about a moment ago, this, this movement towards um, cultural competency and, and trying to bring um, more clients of color and immigrant clients into the fold of mainstream psychiatry. And one woman was telling me that um, she um, had been having you know, a lot of you know, we would call mental health problems um, after immigrating. And... Um, a couple years before she had emigrated from her home country, Colombia, she had been um, sexually assaulted by two men. And after being here for a couple of years, she started to connect her feelings back to that, that rape experience. And when she finally decided to see someone and she was explaining her experience to a psychiatrist, he tried to you know, do the culturally sensitive move of trying to understand her experience through her culture and to try and you know, dispel her self-blame, I presume. And he said, you, know, you have to understand that you come from a different culture. And in many ways, Colombia it has a lot of violence and violence against women, and it's very much a rape culture. And he explained her culture to her in that way. And she said that it was a moment of revelation for her because, you know, she, she realized that, 
you know, maybe it, she wasn't the person who was to blame, that in fact she came from a culture that if it is indeed a rape culture, as this, as this expert says, then maybe it's not her fault. And she said it was really not until months later of seeing this therapist every week and realizing that there were several derogatory comments that he made about this different culture that she came from that um, he really was pretending to have a knowledge of her culture, a culture that she had lived in most of her life. And then, you know, of course, what happened then is, is she became angry. The anger came out as hostility towards him, and it led her to be, you know, even even more severely, um, I guess, stigmatized would be the word, within the system because the social workers, the nurses, and the psychiatrists who she worked with then had an understanding of her as someone who was not one of their good patients, but one of the patients who was being a problem patient because she was resisting whatever diagnoses he was trying to attach to her. And so, in a way, we could, we could, you know, giving the psychiatrist the benefit of the doubt, presume that he was trying to be more culturally sensitive and culturally aware by saying, you're not to blame, it's your culture. Um, but it, it certainly didn't help her in this instance. That's a very powerful example of uh, the racism and colonialism that can often play into the mental health setting and the way that psychiatry operates. Um, what have been some of the your other experiences with uh, working with immigrant women? I mean, I think that you know what one of the things that I was finding over the course of the interviews is that there were themes that came up that you know the one I just pointed to a sort of cultural derogation which which came up so often in in different ways um, by you know usually white male psychiatrists um, you know pretending to have an understanding of this this person's culture. Um, which was, you know, at the at the very least insulting to the person, but could be certainly damaging from a from a therapeutic point of view. And I think another thing, and this is something that that people have talked about, um, but it's it's interesting when you see concrete examples across interviews. And this is the misinterpretation of um, cultural idioms that that people use. I mean, we use them here in this culture, but we don't think of them as being anything out of the ordinary because they're so common. But there was um, a woman who had immigrated, um, an African woman, and she um, had never had any you know, so-called mental health problems, but um, she had found that the aunt who had raised her from, from birth um, back home had died, and she wasn't able to make it back for the funeral and didn't, and didn't go back. And she um, was brought by her husband to the emergency room um, at the psychiatric hospital, uh, she was crying uncontrollably, and um, you know it was interesting. What I did in interviewing these women is it was not only um, talking to them, but also um, having access to their charts. And so I was looking at the, the notes that was was written about them because I had access with their permission to see their charts. So she was described as crying uncontrollably and refusing to stop crying. Um, and when she was admitted, um, she stayed overnight in the hospital. She was calmer the next morning, and she told the nurses that she felt better and she really felt that, that she could go home. And she said that during the night, she had felt her elders on her shoulder whispering to her, her ear that her aunt was fine, that everything was going to be okay. And um, she, felt, she felt much better. She felt that she was you know, making peace with the fact that she wasn't there when her aunt died and that she wasn't there for the funeral. Um, in her chart, those were noted as auditory hallucinations, and the the phrase that was used is that an aggressive treatment plan is recommended for these auditory hallucinations because she had that one time reported hearing voices, and it was it was scary to me in hearing her story because the way that this woman speaks is very um, she's very articulate. But she also is very dramatic. She talks with her arms and she moves her hands and she raises her voice and 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 she's not a quiet, calm, typical uh, patient that the, the nurses would see among someone who has experienced a recent death in the family. She would have come across as quite the opposite. And she said, "Yes, I wasn't just crying; I was crying and screaming when I when I appeared at the hospital." And so. There's, you know, there's so many things going on with the example, this example book, but um, a lot of it really has to do with the fact that she had 
she had this accent. She was talking about her elders in a way that made sense to her as being normal and to them was very abnormal. Yeah, that's a, another powerful example of the way in which a spiritual experience that's maybe comes from a, a specific cultural context um, and manifests itself as hearing voices um, is seen as a hallucination and a symptom of a broken brain and therefore we automatically have to um, have to medicate it. And also your discussion of how anger becomes pathologized um, is really, really central because we know that anger is a big part of the uh, experience of oppression and also of liberation, that once you can clarify what's going on in the society and that the way that injustice and inequality and racism are affecting you, then to have access to that anger is what allows you to change your circumstances and be involved perhaps in activism or movements. And yet the context of psychiatry Anger and non-compliance is, like you said, something that becomes uh, a reason for escalating the treatment and using even more serious medications and continuing people in in lockup. And then you get this power struggle um, situation that that happens between a marginalized person who's trying to respond to their oppression and the mental health system that has suddenly become a representative of keeping the status quo and maintaining the oppression in place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's especially true for for women because women um, are especially not supposed to show anger. And I think that it is certainly a means of control and, and as I mentioned before, keeping people in, in their place so that they're not able to engage in these various forms of resistance. But it also implies a level of inappropriateness on the part of this person who has already been deemed mentally ill. And so, you know, we think back to even in the, in the early 1960s, um, Michel Foucault was writing in Madison Civilization about psychiatry's conflation of mental illness with moral degeneracy, that somehow you're not only saying that this person is suffering mental anguish, but they also are in some way morally defective. And it means that any anger and hostility that's shown on the part of someone who is deemed degenerate in some way is especially inappropriate. And so it means that by medicating that person, you're not only doing something to help that person and individual, you're somehow doing something to help society because you're keeping whatever ills they might be spreading throughout society contained. And I mean, and there's also obviously literal containment of people um, to, you know, uh, uh, purportedly to keep themselves safe and to keep others safe from them. But when we think about, you know, the parallels between people who are incarcerated in prison and what their mental health profiles look like and people who are, you know, in psychiatric institutions, we actually see that they look similar because their life conditions that brought them into these institutions are astoundingly similar and that it's really much more readily explained by understanding oppression and discrimination and poverty than it is by looking at what a person's brain looks like on a brain scan. And we also have to realize that oppression, when we unpack it, has very specific instances within, within a person's life. It means a higher risk of violence. It means um, a greater risk of being poorly nourished, of not being able to properly feed oneself or one's children, all of these things that affect the body and indeed affect the mind. I mean, we know that repeated trauma and repeated um, experience of violence change, changes the way that the brain itself looks, even on brain scans. I mean, we know that the brain is shaped by experience. And yet, the whole idea of mainstream psychiatry is that someone's brain is defective in, in almost almost by nature, there's, 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 there's this biological explanation that really assumes that there's, there are natural differences between a normal person's brain and an abnormal person's brain, and that there's a hard dichotomy there, so that one cannot start off normal and then become abnormal simply through something like the evils of oppression. And yet we know that we know that that's possible because social social influences can change a person's biology, and we know that. What are some other examples from your research that illustrate uh, these dynamics? I mean, I think that in, you know, because my research is um, so much involved in trying to uncover um, the, the lived experience, mostly the lived experiences of women who are given these labels that 
I find a lot of women talk about um, what the uh, the psychologist Dana Jack calls externalized self-perception, which is starting to see oneself not through your own eyes, but through the eyes of others. Um, and if you think about it, a lot of women who immigrate and have um, contacts only within their own families and communities, their, their own cultural communities, sometimes the psychiatrist is the, the one person who represents the dominant culture in their life. Let's say they see them regularly every week. That's, that's the person who represents what, what this, the culture of this country is, and they, they take them as a larger-than-life representation of that. And so one of the things that I find interesting is to listen to how women talk about um, their experiences with their psychiatrist and then to look at the ways that the psychiatrists write about the woman within their medical records charts. Um, again, I looked at, at them solely um, because I had permission of the woman to, to, to do so. And um, there was a very interesting um, Caribbean woman who was labeled as, as depressed. Um, she was actually um, also coming because um, she, she, she wanted help dealing with um, the loss of her, her husband. And um, so it was also a, a bereavement um, issue there. And you know, she talked about um, the compassion of her psychiatrist, and she talked about um, his, his, his attempts, at least, to understand the culture that she came from. She said that he really, he really didn't understand when she was talking about um, you know, her husband and, and that it was a complicated relationship within her community in, 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 um, in the Caribbean with her husband because there, there was conflict there, but he was also part of the community, and so was she. Um, and when, when you, you almost feel for the psychiatrist trying to understand her own cultural perspective and hearing her talk about it, um, especially during her first session with him, um, in looking at the charts, what um, he wrote, I actually have it here because I have all my stacks of notes, as always, around me for my, my different interviews and data. What he wrote in the chart is, Upon admission, the patient reported having no current sexual partners. She reported this despite being dressed in a sexually provocative manner, as is often the way with women from the islands. And that was one of the sentences in his notes that went into her medical records from their first session together. That's an incredible example of, of, of just blatant racism that he's completely covering up in his presentation of being compassionate and understanding towards her. Absolutely. And, the, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated, but, you know, there, there's um, a study that um, some researchers did going through the DSM casebook, which is one of the, the sort of training books that's used to train psychiatrists in how to properly diagnose people. And they give, um, you know, sort of fictitious case examples in this casebook. And what these researchers did is they went through the different um, examples of patients, fictitious patients that were described. And when it was a woman of color, there was a significantly more um, greater chance of the woman being described in sexual terms. There was a sexualization of, of women of color. And the fascinating thing is, you know, it appears so often in, in these notes, these, these terms like sexually provocative and the like, but describing the woman as being sexually provocative, in my eyes, actually says more about the psychiatrist and what's going on in the psychiatrist's mind than it necessarily does about the woman herself. And it sounds like that was um, a racism and a sexism that was that w founded into print in the DSM casebook. It, so it's probably just the tip of the iceberg of what's actually happening um, in clinical settings. Yes, absolutely. And, you, you know, when, when we think about... Um, the assumption that what goes on within um, psychiatry, within the psychotherapeutic setting itself, is, is some kind of decontextualized space that is, is value-free and is not at risk of being tainted by all of these forms of injustice that go on in the world. It really does a disservice to our understanding of what changes need to happen to really transform the system, because it is in many ways a microcosm of all the societal biases that we, that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis and that we see when we look at the lives of women of color, immigrant women, the lives of the poor. And we also have to realize that um, there is a perpetuation 
of these stereotypes as every new generation of psychiatrists is trained because they have to defer to those who wrote the casebook, who are teaching them the casebook, and who wrote the DSM. And so we, when we realize how the system is set up to be self-perpetuating, we realize that it's, it's more than just training new psychotherapists to be more culturally competent. It's really more than just trying to destigmatize mental illness so that people of so-called other cultures can embrace the idea that they too might be mentally ill. It's, it's really um, necessary to step away from those formulations and look at alternatives that can allow us to deal with the real issues as opposed to using the pathologizing of the individual as an excuse to not attend to these social ills. I really like the community development model that you're presenting, the idea that in fact actually we maybe don't even need a kind of a mental health system in the, in the way that it's formulated now, that actually we need to look at the root causes of what it is that leads to people's distress. What would be your vision of a, a way to actually respond to people in need and in crisis and dealing with things like anxiety and depression and more severe um, uh, extreme states, and but from a, a point of view that reflects your insights? I mean, I think one thing that would be useful is moving away from this approach where we as so-called experts come into a community with our diagnostic labels and try and raise awareness as a sort of public service of the fact that, you know, you all might have depression, you, some of you might have schizophrenia, and, and simply relying on those labels. You know, it's different. I, I do understand the movement to do that with conditions like um, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, where there's a stronger link between the sorts of mainstream interventions that could actually improve um, people's longevity and help people live fuller lives. Um, we're not talking about that when we're talking about things like depression and, and mental illness. Um, we're talking about something that um, is not necessarily helped by having a label. The label itself can be damaging. So I think instead of that um, sort of public service approach that relies on the expertise of someone outside the community, what we need to do is look, as I mentioned, at existing strengths within the community, what things are already going on, and in fact, providing more support to expand those things. I mean, all of these, especially you know, in recent years and months, all of these agencies are actually in great danger now of even being able to survive much longer. They need to be expanded and supported even in the most basic economic way, from a prevention point of view. If we had more of these broad-based, um, community-founded um, approaches to helping people um, change the conditions of their lives so that they're not as susceptible to stress and, 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 and mental illness. Like we the could, uh, micro-lending uh, program that you were talking about, uh, getting money yes. into the hands of people to start small businesses, which has worked exactly. around the world. It's just not being used in the U.S. very much. Exactly. And if we were to expand those things, yes, it would take an investment, not a very big investment, but an investment to help sustain those programs. But in the long run, when you look at the, the savings that could happen in keeping people um, away from the problems that we're trying to solve, so uh, out, of, out of unemployment, um, out of the, the cycles of, um, you know, that they have. A lot of the people I interviewed in these settings have a history of going through the prison system and fear that their, their sons might be in the prison system. I mean, we, these themes come up a lot. There's a preventive approach that we could take that could stop this cycle that is not about medication and that could actually save down the road and cost to the healthcare system because by the time a lot of these people, if they ever are seen in mainstream psychiatry, they're seen in a more advanced state, more likely in emergency room settings, um, not showing up to some psychotherapist's office once a week, but, but in, in dire conditions and in psych psychological distress. And so even from simply an economic point of view, these, these preventive approaches um, just make more sense. And of course, ideologically, it really fits with the model that so many of us have of, 
I mean, what, what really psychiatry and psychology is supposed to be about, and that is supporting and enhancing the conditions that allow people to actually feel fulfilled and be able to be productive in a way that matters to them, in a way that makes them feel that they're accomplishing something that, that is important, and that, that they're leaving a positive legacy for the next generation instead of a legacy where there's the risk of crime and violence and, and, and so many of these um, social ills that, that become perpetual. Alicia, we're just about out of time. Can you give us uh, contact information so if people want to get in touch with you? And also, if there are any resources on the web that you might want to point people to to learn more about uh, the connections between social oppression and the mental health system? I think the best thing to do is um, go to um, nyu.edu. And you can go to my um, web page on um, the NYU site. Um, Alicia Alley, A-L-I-S-H-A, last name Alley, A-L-I, and you can search there. And um, you can also look at um, the book that um, Paula Kaplan and Lisa Cosgrove um, edited called Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis, which um, brings together a lot of these issues pertaining to the different forms of oppression that instead of being labeled as oppression are labeled as um, psychiatric conditions. Alicia Ali, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you so much. You've been listening to an interview with Dr. Alicia Ali. She is an associate professor in the Department of Applied Psychology at New York University. Her research focuses on mental health issues among the poor, including the effects of discrimination and the need for collective advocacy for the mental health needs of disadvantaged populations. That's all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Co produced by peer run mental health communities Freedom Center.org and The Icarus Project.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness, radio to help get us broadcast on a station near you or if you just want to share what's in your head contact radio at madnessradio.net